My mother is always lonely. When I ask her a question about what happens during the genocide, she immediately goes to the room and cries. And I feel sad because there's nothing I can do to help her feel better. Those were words spoken very recently by someone whose mother lived through the Rwanda genocide 27 years ago. Geneva Peacecast, a series on solutions from Geneva Peace Week, produced by Interpeace and Fondation Hirondelle. The trauma caused by violence can be handed down through generations. It can continue to have a deep impact on individuals and societies long after the fighting is over. I'm Jackie Dalton, and with me is Frank Kayatari, who is the Great Lakes Regional Representative for Interpeace. And we're going to talk about their new approaches to helping communities deal with trauma, in particular through storytelling. Welcome, Frank. Thank you, Jackie, for this opportunity. One of the premises of your work is that tackling trauma from past events is not only about helping people feel better, but ultimately it's linked to achieving and maintaining peace. Could you tell us about what you've observed regarding this connection? Thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, for individuals to be able to contribute meaningfully to building peace and to uh, social cohesion between them and, and others or between communities, each individual needs to have inner peace. Each individual needs to have uh, stable mental health. And so, We've observed over time, and this is something that now has been confirmed by several studies, that for people to be able to meaningfully contribute to peace building processes within their communities, they need first and foremost uh, to be assisted to deal with the traumas, especially uh, those involved uh, in the uh, violent events such as the genocide in Rwanda. And let's talk a little bit then about the work that you are doing in Rwanda. Uh, you've started a new societal healing program and the pilot phase of this is in Bugusera district, which one is, was one of the areas hardest hit by the 1994 genocide. You started with a baseline study which showed a number of challenges that need addressing. These included uh, a lack of remorse, lack of forgiveness, impunity, uh, poverty was also a factor contributing to underlying mistrust between social groups. And another challenge, of course, is around the release of convicted genocide perpetrators who've completed their prison term, but now reintegration into society is very difficult for everyone. So in a situation where the challenges are so profound and so deeply rooted, where do you begin with addressing them? So indeed, uh, the facts you just mentioned from the baseline are correct. Uh, maybe two other facts that I should highlight that are key uh, for our listeners is that we found uh, that high levels of uh, trauma, for example, uh, uh, the degree of depression among genocide survivors aged 45 and above is as high as 44 uh, percent. The rates, uh, the number of young people aged 27 and below with uh, thoughts of suicidality is at around 27 percent. These are very high incidents uh, or symptoms of uh, mental health uh, problems. Um, so Interpeace, uh, together with the government of Rwanda, uh, have for the past uh, number of years work, been working together to support mental health, uh, especially from the angle of trauma healing. But uh, our recent study shows that although Interpeace and others have been tackling these issues from purely mental health or trauma healing perspective, a more holistic approach was needed, an approach that addresses the challenges of mental health that I just mentioned, but at the same time address uh, triggers within the environment in which these individuals and communities live. Uh, so issues around poverty, uh, issues, of course, related to intergenerational transmission of trauma. Uh, all these issues need to be tackled uh, simultaneously because only then can an individual and the communities heal and uh, be able to build sustainable peace. So what we are doing is to work from three angles. One is to prepare communities 
for prisoners of genocide who are now being released in big numbers because a number of them are, are completing their sentences uh, be, uh, from the Gachacha courts uh, over 20 years ago, uh, that were handed sentences over 20 years ago. So preparing communities for the return of these prisoners. At the same time, we go to prisons and prepare those prisoners about to be released uh, on how to manage uh, the trauma that could come with them going back, returning to the, to the community. The other aspect is that we understand, of course, mental health in itself is a very good uh, start, but it's not an end in itself in helping somebody to actually uh, recover from the effects of the genocide. So we look at the issues of poverty and we help uh, these communities, both uh, survivors of the genocide, ex-prisoners and their respective families to engage in livelihood initiatives because we understand and we know from evidence that poverty is a trigger uh, for trauma itself and can actually worsen trauma for those who already have it uh, as an effect of the genocide. So we have a program that addresses all these three uh, in one program. And it's a process that starts with individual to community healing. And once there's a, a degree of trust that is uh, sufficient enough for people to engage jointly in collaborative livelihood initiatives, then we support them to start those livelihood initiatives, which help them to generate an income. And at the same time, they remain platform for continuous healing uh, and uh, dialogue between the two groups. And part of this program is about storytelling. Could you explain how that works? Yes, thank you very much. So storytelling, we have um, an approach that has been uh, uh, initiated in Rwanda. In Kenya, Rwanda, it's called Mvura Mvure, which means heal me, I heal you. So through this approach, we basically bring together people with the different uh, types of wounds uh, related to the genocide against the Tutsi. We give them an opportunity to tell their stories, to share their experiences, to share their feelings. So over a period of about three months, a group, uh, including genocide survivors and ex-prisoners and their families, will have a platform where they share their uh, stories about what happened, the events around the genocide, most of the time, we actually, these people are not uh, strangers to each other. It's a, an ex-prisoner who is talking to the family whose people they killed or participated at least in killing. Of course, the process starts with each group. So in this case, for example, a group of genocide survivors being prepared before they meet uh, the people that committed the crime. Uh, and of course, the prisoners also being prepared separately until they are ready to meet and have a conversation. So the initial stages are very difficult. It, they are characterized by a lot of pain, a lot of grief, a lot of anger. But then over time, each individual in these groups starts opening up and starts looking, okay, so we have lived through this, what next? Uh, and so they start envisioning the future together and they end up in some cases, like in Bugesera district, we have at least two reconciliation villages, which are settlements where genocide survivors, ex-prisoners live side by side. So like in one village, there are more than 110 households. And it's like uh, a zebra sort of formula. So one house is for ex-prisoner, the next house is for survivor, the next for ex-prisoner. And these are people who have been living together, for example, some of them for the past 15 years. So it's a very difficult and rigorous journey. It's a very um, emotionally draining journey, but in the end, we have evidence that it has worked. It sounds like a, an enormous and really uh, complex task. And thinking back to the quote that I shared at the beginning of this program, uh, which was actually from a participant in the initial study for this project, uh, where the child of a genocide survivor spoke about the impossibility of having any conversation about the genocide with their mother, you know, still 27 years after it all happened. And one of the things that was highlighted in your research is the fact that parents are not willing always to talk about what happened. And the outcome is that that often causes children to feel confused or angry or insecure. But I'm also wondering, is there a risk sometimes that if you do open up 
And if a parent does perhaps start talking to a child uh, or to other people about what happened, it might even cause problems um, because they'll learn about the terrible events and perhaps even start wishing for vengeance. So I guess my question is, is talking always good? Thank you very much for that good question. Well, of course, as I said, beginning, especially when people start opening up, uh, are very sensitive. Some people, of course, uh, in the first place, might fear opening up, especially those ones who have not been maybe to jail, but they know uh, they should have revealed certain information. So that sometimes they fear that if they, uh, they uh, open up about certain information, either I roll, they uh, had in the genocide, or maybe something they should have said to support the judicial process. Normally, what we do to avoid especially causing harm is that we ensure that the space in which these people are having this kind of uh, dialogue is safe enough, both in terms of having professionals to support them psychologically, because they, some of them, almost all of them break, break down uh, most of the time. Then we have professionals who, whose job is to make sure that they help those who need help. The other uh, aspect is that for us, uh, as Interpeace, as peace building organization, of course, we look at how do we make sure that when these people make that step, uh, it, we don't contribute to them going uh, back uh, for less, you know, uh, further than we found them, but rather make a step forward in terms of healing and reconciliation. So, when, for example, a young person uh, learns about their parents' role in the genocide, which most of the time, by the way, uh, many parents, even those who have been to prison, most of them did not tell their children the truth. So either they told them, well, they took me to prison because my neighbor lied about uh, my role. Or sometimes if a father is in jail, the mother will not even reveal that they're in jail because of genocide-related crimes. They'll say, well, he had an accident, he knocked someone, um, and uh, they took him to jail for a long time. And the parents, when they actually have an opportunity to finally tell the truth to their children, we've had stories of many parents telling us, I have not slept for the past 27 years, only when I opened up and told my child exactly what had happened, what I had done, uh, or what had happened to me, because we are talking about uh, survivors and uh, prisoners, but there are women who were raped during the genocide and they, from those rape, children were born. And those children have not known their parents for 25, 27 years now. And their mothers open up to say, well, this is the circumstances in which we are born. Both the mother and the child, most of the time, they tell you only when I opened up is when I've been able to sleep. Only when I opened up is when I have actually felt that I have an inner peace. We had one testimony from a young, from a girl uh, who is a young mother at the moment, but she was born 27 years ago to uh, out of rape. And she told us a story, a very moving story, uh, that for all these years, she has observed or thought that she was hated by her mother because of the way the relationship she has had with her mother, where the mother is, um, seems always to be upset with her, even verbalizes not loving her. Uh, and then she has always been wondering, why is it that either family, when she goes to, uh, to, to, to the family of the mother, uh, the look they give her, the treatment they give her is that of neglect, that she, she has felt not loved for the past two, seven years without knowing why. And when the mother finally was able through this program, uh, she went through the process of healing and she went back and managed to open up and tell her daughter. So the daughter was telling us, of course, I felt somehow guilty uh, in her words I'm using now, that all this while I've misunderstood my mother, but that's because I actually never knew what she was going through. But now that she has opened up and I, I know what she has gone through, I am terribly sympathizing with her. And I don't know if I would have done better if, if I were in her shoes. I'm trying to put myself in my mother's shoes now, knowing what she had gone through, knowing that when she saw me, she remembered those events. Um, so this 
through uh, a number of other interventions that we are using. For example, we've developed a number of protocols, including family therapy protocols, where we can help families individually and multifamily setups to create an environment where stories like this can be told in a safe environment so that the reconciliation journey that the government of Rwanda has invested in for the past many years can take a more sustainable shape by people actually, uh, I would say, starting to relate from a very true uh, information and opening up uh, to each other first. And the healing that you've described there between a child and parent, have you seen similar things uh, between maybe people who, whose own family might have been killed by someone who is now sitting in front of them? Have people who are from opposing sides been able to talk to each other and reconcile in some way? Yes, um, I'll give another example, a very practical one. Um, there's this group, uh, it's an association uh, formed by ex-prisoners of the genocide and survivors of the genocide. It's called the Humurizanye. The Humurizanye literally translates, translated in English would be, let's comfort each other. And in that group, they are mainly uh, men, ex-genocide uh, prisoners, who live side and work side by side with uh, mainly older women whose children, husbands were killed during the genocide. So it's older women with no family members. And in that group, one of the many initiatives they have is that those who are energetic among that community, who are mainly those men who uh, returned from prison, actually do at least once a week uh, support or help the elder women to do farming. And this is a voluntary community organized initiatives um, so that they make, you know, help them survive. We have seen in some cases where genocide survivors pay school fees or health insurance for children from the families of genocide perpetrators because those families don't have enough means. These are real stories on the ground. Frank, and how do you feel when you witness these things happening? Um, I must say, um, before, for example, personally, before I started implementing this program and uh, uh, colleagues or other people would tell me, ah, there's this reconciliation village and this is how people survive, I thought, well, that's a joke. How can such a thing happen? But um, I think the past year has been a changing experience for me personally. But when I go and witness how these people live, how somebody is able to leave their child uh, at home, knowing that the next door neighbor uh, participated in the genocide uh, and they feel comfortable to leave them with their children, to call on them when they need help. It's uh, difficult to understand, but not so difficult, to, especially when you follow the process through which they go until get, they get to that point. It's a very painful process for them, definitely. Uh, a lot of regrets, a lot of remorse, a lot of uh, breaking down and uh, getting up. But in the end, it feels very, very fulfilling, both for, of course, the, these people involved and for, I would say, people like us who are working in these programs on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you, Frank. That's really extraordinary. I'm wondering, before we end, whether you could share with the rest of us three tips or recommendations for those who are seeking to support communities to heal from traumatic events, what guidance would you give them? So I would say, uh, first, focus on resilience factors uh, in those communities, because uh, there's usually a tendency to focus on things that are not working, while there are very many good examples that are working. So first focus on those successes and find out why they happened and um, amplify the factors that made it happen. Two, it's really important uh, to look, to focus on the long term, on the future. Looking ahead means you also have to focus even on generations that were not around when the traumatic 
the actual traumatic events happened because the trauma is transmissible and it can actually last for many generations. And number three, be holistic. Look not just at the individuals, but look at the environment around them. What is it that could trigger an individual even after they have made a step towards healing? What is it in their environment that it could actually take them back? Is it poverty? Uh, is it, for example, the fact that you only focused on one side of uh, the community? So, for example, in this case, perpetrator, not the, 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 the participants or the perpetrators of the genocide, uh, the survivors, rather. So look at all sectors of society and consider them candidates uh, for trauma and impact of trauma and provide the holistic uh, uh, support. I'm Jackie Dalton from Fondation Hirondel, and I've been talking to Frank Cayetare, Great Lakes Regional Representative for Interpeace. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. Thank you very much, Jackie. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Geneva Peacecast, produced by Interpeace and Fondation Hirondel.